start another episode of the high ground powered by premier companies sal how's it going doing wonderful today great hey we got a guest in-house from uh from country mark we're glad to have matt makinson the vice president of supply and marketing at country mark with us and uh we're going to talk a whole lot about the world of acronyms that you live in. Uh, we're going to title this The Link Between Agriculture industry, and Energy in a Net Zero World. That's what we're going to call this. And uh, you have a lot to ground to cover, so I'm going to kick it to you for an introduction, and then uh, we're going to we're going to travel, navigate through this outline. All right. No, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, and manage the group that moves the products, prices the products, tries to get crude to the refinery, and uh make that engine run great great um so how long have you been there and uh, started in 13 so okay. it'll be maybe nine years this year okay then you all do right. the all the purchasing of the raw cr- we had to uh, before we've had some experience so you buy all the crude and then you price it the finished products yeah, so I can explain that briefly. The um, so we got a team, a bunch of people. Um, we buy you know local Illinois Basin crude. We buy crude from uh, other parts of the United States. Bring it into the refinery and run it through the refinery down in Mount Vernon. And then there's a bunch of other products, uh, you know, butane, isobutane, things that the refinery needs. You make gasoline and diesel. Ship it into our terminals so that our members and customers can pick up gas and diesel at the terminals. All right. All right. Well, we're driven a lot by uh, sustainability. Uh, everything it seems to be going that way. We'll jump into ESG and the uh, the popularity of of that acronym. But uh, tell us a little bit about the RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard. How do you view it? Yeah, I mean it's a complicated program. Um, and to back up, you're owned by farmers, so that's right. That's you've right. been very pro. You're very pro farmer for sure. So yeah, Country Mark has been um, you know active at blending ethanol for for decades. Um, went to you know E10 blends on gasoline in 2008, but been building biodiesel since 2003. So a long history of renewables supporting the ag markets, um, and you know it, that's what our customers want and what our members um, you know produce. So we've always supported that. The RFS originally, um, you know, it was a, it was a um, you know energy security legislation. Um, designed to increase renewables over time, and it's done that. Um, we b- blend a lot of renewables. The targets, you know, somewhere around 20 billion gallons these days, but the original program was 36 billion gallons by this time. And so a lot's changed since since the, that legislation was made. They put uh, renewable targets in the legislation, and for a variety of reasons, we haven't come close to those. So technology you know, back then they thought that corn stover and different biomass and wood pulp would be much more popular and the technology would be there and it's not. Um, you know, average miles per gallon has increased due to CAFE standards, which is, you know, like a legislation driving corporate, um, you know, car manufacturers to improve the gas mileage of their vehicles. And so people drive less for some societal reasons. Um, cars have gotten more efficient. And the world is just a lot different than it was in 2007 when this when this came out. Well, we talked about the cafe standards just a little bit, and the fact that that vehicles, I mean, regardless of what would happen with electric, what would happen with with any of those other other methods of of providing propulsion for these vehicles other than an internal combustion engine, if none of those happen, we're still in a declining market from from usage I yeah mean, you're for sure. seeing that for and, sure. and we have to understand that 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 serves bio and crude both i mean so yeah, for sure usage yep. is going down mm-hmm. the oil i mean gas demand is going down yeah i mean it's COVID obviously has complicated many many things um but yeah when, when the rfs legislation was envisioned and, and came to fruition you know the expectation was increased gasoline usage you know for a long time and we've really kind of flatlined Mm. at you know like since 2015 or so um we you know with different gyrations based around you know covid and high prices and different things but we're fairly flat and so it's hard to blend more renewables into the same pool Mm. Um, and then obviously with covid you cut the demand significantly Um, the only way to increase the renewables is to increase the percentages which is a challenge so you have uh, you have some background with grain markets as well as uh, the energy markets. Why don't you give us a little bit of that history and 
and what, where you've been involved. No, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at the landscape today, and we talk about ESG, we talk about renewables and how to, you know, lower emissions. Um, we look at that. I, mean, I think I have an interesting perspective. So I worked um, after college. I moved to Chicago, um, worked at a couple different places. I got my uh, commodities license, worked for a brokerage, and I worked on the floor of the soybean options pit. Uh, which was a great experience, a lot of fun, um, just a clerk down there and learned a lot about, about that world. And then I did like proprietary day trading for a company in Chicago um, and traded currencies and oil and a little bit of grains. And that was kind of the world that I lived in. Um, and then I moved back to Indiana and um, worked for a popcorn company. And so I was you know, deeply immersed in the grain, grain world, you know, supply, demand, knew that you know, every which way. Um, you know, weather maps every 12 hours and was it was really in that world. And then when I came to Countrymark, um, the reason I was interested in that in that role was my previous experience was all paper trading type of stuff, you know, using financial markets to hedge risk or, to, you know, make, make money. And Countrymark was a unique opportunity where we, we move real stuff. You know, we have barges we can move. Um, we're getting rail cars. You're buying crude. Um, so it was, it was a different, you know, unique thing for me that you could be part of, you know, the, the supply chain and logistics to do something, something real, which I was attractive to me. Um, so I think I have a unique experience because when I went, um, I was, you know, deep in the, in the grain supply demand tables and the RFS and the ethanol demand on the corn supply demand was just a line. You know, it was a legislatively driven. Um, people knew what it was. And it was just demand. And I didn't really know anything about how refineries work, how the gasoline blending system in the United States works, um, or the challenges of that. It wasn't part of that world. And so, you know, today when we look at, you know, more renewables, more ethanol, uh, we can talk about renewable diesel, and obviously biodiesel has been around for a while. This, there's this confluence of the ag world and the energy world that have always been, you know, pretty closely linked. And I think that link is going to get stronger and stronger. Um, and we've seen that over the past year, for sure. When you mean confluence, do you mean kind of in cooperation or is it animosity? Well, no, I, I mean, to me, I think it's just that the ags are becoming energy. Um, and so it's more of... You know, a lot of people have different ideas about what's best to do. So if you say, well, we have this overall goal that we need to lower emissions. Um, renewables do that. Renewables, you know, um, ethanol and biodiesel and other forms of renewables have lower tailpipe emissions than hydrocarbons. So if that's the solution to help you do that, then you need resources. And you look at, well, how do I accomplish that? Well, I need land. So you got to have land to produce. Um, but... You're also trying to produce this with less input, so you need less diesel. So you, there's this there's this challenge of how do we provide the energy that the world needs? How do we use renewables to do that with a limited pool of resources? So as we as we move into um, what what your capacity is today as country mark, mm-hmm. I mean you're refining crude and you're blending and you're doing all the blending you can do, yeah, which is still not enough. If I understand that correctly? No, for sure. I mean, yeah, the RFS, um, basically the easiest way to think about it is, in my, in my opinion, is that the math is just, is just broken. Um, we really need to blend around 11.9 to 12% is kind of what we think the mandates will be. The mandates have been um, delayed and, and uncertain for quite some time. So there's, there's a proposal to, you know, um, set the volumes for you know, last year and, and this year. And that's not finalized yet, but those volumes, we really need to blend about 12%. So Countrymark, you know, we make gas and diesel, and the rule is it's whatever your gasoline and diesel production is that goes into transportation fuels. You need to blend. It's, it's fairly complicated, different types of, of uh, renewables to meet that mandate. So Countrymark tries to blend you know, 10% ethanol into all the gasoline, um, and we get close to that. But we really don't see a demand for 10% biodiesel. Um, and so nationally... Um, the United States is around 10.5% ethanol and a little over 5% biodiesel. So if the mandate for all the renewables is close to 12%, the math just doesn't work. Um, so that's, and, that's, and that's really the problem that we have. Um, it, it probably needs to be changed and redriven, um, but there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different um, perspectives on, on how to do that best. 
Well, you can see where the math fell apart. If it's if the gas has been flatlined since 2015, mm-hmm. for whichever reason, and you're probably with assumptions back in 2007 or that's right. uh, with assumptions of a growth market, that just broke the math. I yeah. Mean, uh, yeah, so there's there are um, you know outlets for, to change that in the legislation. So you know if there's you know if you don't meet the mandate, the EPA has authority to do different things, and they've done that. So they've lowered the volumes to kind of be in line, but they're kind of ever increasing mandates. And as you know, the mandates have continued to increase. The math becomes harder and harder, and you know the prices of rents has is obviously um, driven high. You know, higher over the past several years. Um, you know, we are over a dollar fifty on ethanol rins now, which is you know near the highest that we've ever been. Um, so, it's, so that's a challenge for Countrymark. We're um, specifically challenged just because we're a diesel centric um, you know company. Obviously, we sell to farmers and to schools, and this is our our members' niche market, and this is where we go to market. We make a lot of diesel, and so you know some refineries on the Gulf Coast they might make sixty five seventy percent gasoline. Um, and we're much less than that. We're close to 45% diesel. And so it's a lot harder to blend, you know, the appropriate amount of biodiesel that's needed to meet the mandate. Um, and so it's just a challenge for us. And we're forced to go to the market and buy RINs. When RINs are expensive, it's a cost to the company. It's a, it's a burden to us for sure. Does that help the environment when you have to buy RINs? Yeah, I mean, in theory, what's, what's a, happening is what's that What's a RIN? Buying, Sorry. Oh, I'm the slow, I'm okay, the slow you, kid. You want to explain a RIN? Yeah, I can't. I can't. <laughs> the so bird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that one. It starts with an R. So, yeah, so it's a RIN, Renewable Identification Number. And basically, an ethanol, we'll take ethanol because that's, that's easy. An ethanol uh, producer produces gallon ethanol, and they sell it to somebody like Countrymark. We buy it. When we blend that ethanol into the fuel... Um, the RIN is attached to the ethanol and it gets separated. And so once it gets blended into gasoline, you separate the RIN and it's just an identification number. I think it's 36 digits long. Every, every gallon is tracked that way. And then now Countrymark owns this kind of, you know, digital RIN. Um, and at the end of the year, um, we're required to, um, you know, tell the EPA, this is all the gasoline and diesel that we produced for the year. And then we're supposed to have a certain amount of RINs, you know, somewhere around 12% of our production, a certain amount of RINs that we submit to the EPA and retire them. So it's kind of just a credit system that you, um, you know, have to give to the EPA through a computer system at the end of the year. Um, and so if you blend a bunch of gasoline, uh, blend a bunch of ethanol and biodiesel, then you can get close to it. Um, but the way the mandates are currently, um, you know, we have, we have millions of RINs that we have to buy still. Um, and, and the way you do that is you buy those from somebody else that has already blended the fuel. So it could be um, a non-obligated party, um, like a retailer that you know buys gasoline and then blends ethanol into it, and they get a RIN. Well, those those entities aren't obligated by the RFS, and so then they can get those RINs and then sell them to somebody else. So it's supposed to be a balancing system between different people. There's some refineries that don't blend any ethanol, and they produce gasoline and stick it into a pipeline, and it goes, you know, across the country. Country Marks is, is unique in the sense that we have, you know, terminals where trucks can pick up gasoline and diesel. We have blending, uh, you know, ethanol and biodiesel blending at all of our terminals. So we kind of have that whole system, which, which is a, you know, benefit to our customers and to our company. Uh, but some people don't do that. So it, the RIN was intended to be like a balancing system across people with different capabilities. But if the mandate um, is larger than what's possible, then you start to have challenges and higher prices on RINs. That seems to be where we are today. So what you said earlier, you said in a refiner, some refiners will, will, will refine gasoline and shove it into a pipeline and send it on somewhere. Mm-hmm. Are they required? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're required. Yes. So it's the retailers who buy gas that's already blended that get a credit for it. They have they have no obligation. So they end up with a RIN. They end up with something that they buy that they can then sell. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it could be a, a wide variety of participants. It could be trading shops. So a trading shop could be 
know, buying gasoline, just bulk, we call it 84 C Bob. So it's like a low octane gasoline component. You blend ethanol with that and you get an 87 octane, you know, like you see at the pump. Um, so different trading companies could be buying large quantities of just CBOP gasoline and then buying ethanol by barge or by rail car, any way that they can do that and then blending that. Or it could be as simple as, you know, I have a tank, I buy some gasoline and I buy some ethanol and I blend it and sell it and I can get a rent for that when I do that. Um, so it could be retailers, it could be trading companies, it could be anybody. But yeah, once they do that, um, they're, they're not the producer of the you know, base fuel and so they're not obligated by the EPA and so they can separate the RIN and then sell it to someone like Countrymark. Okay. It's like a new, it's like a currency. I mean, it's almost like a, like a side currency that we're involved in. We're, I mean, it's like, what's not to like about this, about ethanol? I mean, mm-hmm. and it feels like it's gotten pretty complicated mm-hmm. with uh, some of the tracking systems. Is that, is that what's really doing it? That I guess the mandate's the first part, but then the, then you have the, the tracking system that's associated with it. Mm-hmm. Is there a way out without legislation? Uh, legislation? Chin? Well, no, I mean, I think that if you step back and you say, you know, what did the, this legislation try to accomplish? It tried to increase renewables, increase energy security in the United States, which has done that. We are now, you know, the industry has changed and pretty much the universal um, fuel in the United States is a 10% ethanol gasoline. Most people don't even know that there's 10% ethanol in it. I go to the pump and that's what's there. So we've done that. The challenge is that if you say, well, how can we increase that amount to a higher level? That's where the challenges start to come. Um, there's been different you know, gyrations around E15. E15 would be a solution um, where you could blend you know, an extra 5% ethanol in, um, and different participants have different opinions about that. Um, it gets pretty complicated with read vapor pressure and, and, and a little bit inane. Um, but some people, you know, would, would really support it. And Country Mark's always been a supporter of E15. Um, in theory, you know, I would, it would allow us to blend more ethanol um, and get more RINs, and it could lower our total cost of, of complying with the program. Um, but it, it does get complicated. You know, other participants, if you look at, you know, across the, across the state, um, E15 is a little bit cheaper. And so what happens is the people that get that RIN and that benefit of that extra 5%, they're choosing to discount the fuel which is, you know, good for the customer. It attracts, you know, the customer, and they say, hey, I can get a 15% ethanol product, and it's a little bit cheaper. Um, but it's higher octane, right? Yeah, it's an yeah. 88 octane. Um, and so, you know, that's a good value proposition for the consumer, um, but it obviously shrinks the benefit, you know, if, if you're giving some of that away. So we'll see. I mean, there is a – there's an infrastructure problem. It's not easy to have E15. We're, we're an E10 country. Um, it's going to require investment, um, you know, tanks at all. And we've got a, you know, well over 120,000 gas stations in the United States. So it's a big undertaking, and it's going to take a while to really get an E15 nationwide if that ever does happen. And then you look at, you know, the supply of, of corn, um, ethanol, and you say it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a long-term, um, you know, transition, I guess. We're at a dwindling stock position in corn right now. That's right. So it's... I mean that's it comes down to food versus fuel like we like we've been talking about. So um ESG you mentioned it earlier. Uh for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with ESG, you want to jump into that just a little bit and tell us why no, that's sure. our new guiding our new guiding principle. No, for sure. So yeah, I mean obviously there's been an increase in focus, an increasing focus on ESG and that acronym is environmental, social and governance. So you know, a lot of the focus is environmental. Um, Social is, you know, how you interact with your customers and your employees and your community and trying to do, you know, make decisions in your business that are positive in that way. Governance is related to, you know, how your board is or how your executive team is and how you run your company. Um, But a lot of the focus is on environmental. That's really the biggest challenge. And, you know, if the world says, you know, we have to lower emissions and, um, you know, of, of greenhouse gases. If that's the goal, then there's a bunch of ways to do that. Um, you know, renewable fuels, which we've been talking about, is one of them. They, they have less tailpipe emissions, and so that's a way to lower, you know, obviously the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of fuel. And kind of what, you know, what we're going to talk about today is that I see, I see challenges in how this can work. Um, 
if you look at across the landscape outside of just transportation fuels, we obviously have you know power generation for electricity. Um, the solutions to um, lower emissions for that are wind and solar, um, and those require l- large you know um, tracts of land. And if you say, well, okay, we also want to um, you know lower the emissions of transportation fuels, and if the, if the solution of that is uh, more renewables. That also requires a lot of land. Um, you know, just to kind of put some of that in perspective, you know, total planted crops is somewhere around 317 million acres in the United States. If you wanted to, um, you know, have enough solar and enough wind power to, to change the grid, you need about 250 million acres. And then, and then that's just kind of where we are today. And you say, okay, well, we also need more acres for more ethanol and more, you know, um, soybean oil for, for biodiesel or renewable diesel. You start adding that up and it's all these things are competing for the same land. And that's kind of what, what we've been talking about is if you say, well, I need 30 million acres to accomplish, you know, you know biodiesel production goals. And if I need 30 million acres for ethanol goals and I need 250 million where are you going to get it? And, and it's different participants, obviously, um, fighting over the same resource. Um, and, you know, the volumes, I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot at Country Mark is that the scale of the energy industry is so massive, it's hard, it's hard for people to comprehend. And truthfully, it's hard for me to comprehend. Um, and that's one of the things I like about the industry is that, you know, globally we're using almost 100 million barrels a day of crude oil. And you track that all the way through this global economy, it's it's a huge undertaking to replace even 10% of that. Um, and we're trying to do this transition in, you know, at a rapid pace, um, and we see challenges with how that's going to occur. It's a lot of people moving after the same land, um, and we just see that that link between agriculture and energy fighting for the same way to do that. Well, Matt, what scares me is that once a piece of land leaves ag and goes into uh, solar panels, it's gone forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, that ground can, I don't know that all the listeners understand that, mm-hmm. that uh, when you tear up a prime farm ground and put solar panels there, it'll never be farmed again. And it'll never be food production. It'll never be ethanol production. It'll never be anything except for some sort of commercial structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the soil's disturbed, and it'll never be productive land again. So there's no putting the genie back in the bottle once once you convert that land. Um, that's kind of concerning because you said that we're trying to do this in a short time frame. Mm-hmm. And it feels like, you know, just from a, a layman's perspective, that I don't feel like the outcomes aren't being really discussed very much as it is as the rush to get to the new energy sources no for sure i mean i think it's going to be and, and, and that's and, and that's the big challenge i'm not sure where it's going to go i mean obviously there could be you know government policies that drive a lot of these things whether it's the rfs you know and, and that's part of what we've seen you know obviously soybean oil is at high prices and um you know soybeans are at high prices and corn at high prices and and a lot of this is due to you know supply chain and obviously the you know russian invasion has driven a lot of these things but um you, you know before that a lot of these oils and fats and things were you know at double where they were a, a year or so ago and that's driven by policy and so what's happened is you know california has an emissions program um, it's called LCFS, which is Low Carbon Fuel Standard, and they have targets to lower their um, emissions over a period of time. And that's been around for a while, and as those emissions are getting more and more stringent, then people have tried to come up with new ways to do that. So if you're in California and you blend ethanol or biodiesel, um, that lowers the emissions of your fuel, and you are, um, are required to do that if you're a refinery there. And as those emissions have gotten stricter, people have come up with new ways to do that. So you can use, you know, corn oil, and you there's a new technology um, called renewable diesel, and it basically it's a refining technology. If you look at traditional, you know, soybean oil like we talk about for biodiesel, it's um, it's called FAME, fatty acid methyl ester, and it's an esterification process, which I won't get into the, the molecules. <laughs> go, that's not go ahead. Right. None of us here can prove you wrong. You can say whatever you want. You and can. That's we'll sit patiently. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so the esterification process, that's traditional biodiesel, you know, like we do across the country today. So you're taking soybean oil and, you know, you're doing this. And now renewable diesel is a refining technology that's basically hydro-treated vegetable oil. So new technology, you know, human innovation, obviously. I'm applying that technology in a different way and creating a renewable diesel product. product. And that product has some benefits. Um, It's molecularly identical to hydrocarbon diesel, so you can blend it. Um, much more easily. You can blend it, you know, put it in a pipeline and ship it. You don't have a lot of the separation concerns that you'd have if you were, you know, blending traditional biodiesel. Um, and so it's a good quality product. Um, and it's a, you know, a lower, it's recognized as a lower, um, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions product. And so what people are doing now is they're using this new technology because California um, it's a benefit for you if you make a renewable diesel and you sell it in California because of this LCFS program. And so that's what's been driving several big refiners and big companies of doing these big projects and trying to make a lot of renewable diesel, shipping it to California, and trying to monetize that. And, you know, that's what's driving a lot of the, um, you know, push. And so you've seen corn oil prices jump incredibly high. And obviously, you know, all these fats and oils, they're able to be used in this technology, greases and cooking grease and all types of different um, fats. And so we're starting to see a run on fats as people are trying to, um, you know, to, to secure this, to meet this California mandate. And one of the things that I, you know, kind of going back to my experience around, I kind of, you know, have a good understanding of the grain industry, big picture, and and, the, and then obviously the scope of the, you know, of the energy industry. And so we kind of asked the question is like, well, how, how big can that get if you, you know, if you kind of compared, you know, all the soybean oil in the whole country and all the greases and all the fats and you add all that up. And it's, it's somewhere around 400,000 barrels a day. So you take all the soybean oil, all the fats, somewhere around 400,000 barrels a day, which is a lot. <laughs> but we use about 5 million barrels of diesel a day in the United States. And so you say, wow, we take every oil, all this stuff, and we're not even at 10% of what's demanded So it's not a replacement for diesel. It's not a replacement for hydrocarbons. It's a new technology and a lot of dollars are chasing a limited supply. And so people say, well, you know, obviously you don't want to, you should never underestimate the productivity of American farming or the ingenuity of American manufacturing and people figure it out. You know, yield, new seeds, all the different ways that, you know, um, you know, crop spacing. We can do a lot of things to improve yield. Um, but if you look at, you say, hey, I take all the soybean oil out of the whole, you know, U.S. food supply and I stick it into fuel and I'm not at 10%, hmm. that's not a yield. You know, you can't solve that with yield. I mean, that's, that's just a, that math doesn't work. Um, and then you kind of say, well, we just need more acres. And that kind of goes back to the earlier thing where, you know, the wind people, the solar people, they want the acres too. And so you talk about, you know, we're in this inflationary environment right now. Um, you know, food prices are up. Um, obviously, gasoline and diesel prices are up. And you say, this is kind of that confluence of things where I don't know which way it's going to go, but it's not going to work. Uh, <laughs> there's not enough oils and there's not enough um, crops to replace. And so it's people fighting, trying to make, you know, trying to um, figure it out. And there's always been this underlying current of affordable food in the United States. I mean, we're in the land of plenty. And that, you know, you, you, read, you read articles all the time that say that there are people buying buying ground for grain production at twenty thousand plus dollars an acre and just think and I, I don't know how long food stays affordable at those rates if the farmers treat it adequately upon you know trying to support those kind of uh those kind of conditions in, in economics that that have been set on these operations and yeah it's uh, this is a this is a whole different world whenever you i mean you're now down to saying that you you know the the conversations being had we'll take all of the soybean oil and put it into fuel and we're still not 10 percent there well that's what struck me Matt, matt's talking like dumping all the fry bins out of mcdonald's and all the oil from all the and we're still only at Four hundred thousand, mm-hmm. which is just a fraction. You said ten percent ish mm-hmm. of the total. There's no way to. What did you say? It doesn't. I'm not sure where it'll go, but it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. No, no, yeah. That's right, and, and that and that's kind of what we've been talking about. 
um, and trying you know look at the landscape and you know obviously COVID um, you know changed a lot of things. And one of the things that I thought at the time was you know this push for greenhouse gas emissions either by mandate or policy or however this works um, that'll get paused and really it accelerated it. And you kind of look at the acceleration of ESG and um, we don't have any you know, national policies driving this yet, but. Um, you know, obviously the publicly traded companies, they're being driven by, um, you know, either activist investors or just, you know, the, the cultural tur- uh, current of you need to focus on this and you need to have a plan for this. And what's your goal and, and what's your 10 year goal and your 20 year goal? How are you going to manage this? So people are racing to try to figure it out. Um, and when you look at how all this is going to work, it's, it, we struggle to see, you know, how this is going to work. And, and really, I think uh, my general conclusion is, is that um, it's not going to work. And what will happen is you risk, you know, shortages um, and, and certainly price volatility. And, we, and we've seen that recently. I mean, obviously, that we had the, you know, storms in Texas last year and, you know, you know, um, you know we had, you know, power outages and, as you move to, you know, somewhat less reliable energy sources, some of these things um, start to come to a head. And this is kind of continued with another, you know, un, you know, somewhat unpredictable event of, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, obviously changes the supply balance of a bunch of different raw materials, um, you know, grains and energy and challenges all across the world. And there's just not enough. Um, there's too many, you know, uh, too many dollars chasing too few goods, I guess. If I mean, Matt, if you could wave, wave a magic wand and reset everything, um, I mean, how would you? What could we do to to kind of fix where we're at? I mean, so ethanol is a cleaner; it is renewable. Mm-hmm. It's cleaner uh, emissions. Mm-hmm. Um, we know we have to have uh, oil, crude oil, for for power. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's the if you could just pause everything now and reset it, what would be the, if you could get a wish list of things that you, if you were king for a day, what would you, what would you do to fix this? And we can edit all this. We don't usually edit, but we could edit if we had to. So we can let, it, know. let it rip so we can let get it, it recorded. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's fine. Yeah. I mean, okay. So if you look back at the past two years, um, you know, now we're in a world with, you know, high, you know, high crude oil prices. Part of that is just driven by demand in Russia, but part of it is is driven by denigration of the hydrocarbon industry. You know, it's dirty, it's bad. Investors have pulled back from that. Um, you know, obviously prices were very low in 2020, and there was a lot of wealth destroyed, and um, people were hesitant to invest. And to produce crude oil, you got to continue to invest in it. Um, every time you take a barrel out, you, that, that barrel's gone forever, and you have to go find new barrels of crude. So I think... Step one is, you know, obviously recognize that hydrocarbons fuel the world. You know, it's, you know, coal, gas, and crude oil is 80% of the energy that we're using globally. Um, and that is the primary energy source, and it will be for quite some time. Um, don't denigrate the industry. Um, it's provided, you know, quality of, of, of standard of living for, you know, billions of people. Um, and encourage people, you know, in the United States um, to invest and produce and, you know, be that supply. Um, right now we're seeing, you know, really high prices, but producers all across the country are hesitant to invest because of what are the regulations going to be regarding emissions and, you know, how, you know, how is my company going to be penalized in the future? It makes me a little nervous. Instead, I'll just, you know, uh, produce the crude that I have, do the minimum I kind of need to do and, and, uh, you know, return, you know, um, uh, dividends back to shareholders. That's kind of a lot of what, you know, of what the oil producers are doing. So step one, I would think would be don't denigrate the industry, encourage investment and in production. Um, and then you look at RFS. I mean, I think that, you know, the volumes that are mandated um, aren't feasible. There's a bunch of different solutions for that. Um, you know, one of the solutions that we've talked about is, you know, obviously it could be a different mandate for gasoline and for diesel. So the fact that they're combined and then you're supposed to blend, you know, a percentage, and it's kind of based on both of those. They're really two different markets, um, gasoline and diesel. And so if, if I had my wish, it would be if there is an RFS mandate, it would be, you know, recognizing those two different products and having percentages accordingly that are more in line with reality. And then I, we've, we've talked for, for many years um, and tried to push a 95 RON. 
which is a 95 research octane number. So it's a, just a higher octane product. And the reason that we think that's a good solution is because um, if you look at, you know, um, we, we haven't talked a lot about electric vehicles, but electric vehicles also have the same challenge that we've talked about with renewals. Renewables, you don't need the land so much, but you need to mine. <laughs> so it's, it's mining of the land. Um, hmm. I've heard things like you have to mine 500,000 pounds of material um, to get a thousand pounds of you know renew uh, of um, you know minerals for Flipping for EV up. batteries, yeah. and so you're doing huge mining um, all across the world, um, you know using diesel heavy equipment and ships to move all this around the world, and it seems like a, a fairly inefficient system. Um, and a lot of that stuff is not in the United States. We don't have a lot of those. It's hard to get a mine permitted or any of those kind of, you know, challenges um, from an environmental perspective. And so we're, we're changing from, um, you know, the, the intent of the RFS was, um, you know, blending renewables, but a lot of it was energy security. And when you start looking at EVs, it's moving to, you know, um, land that's controlled by other countries and other parts of the world. So that's a challenge. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we've that we've been focusing on is, you know, a higher octane fuel. So if you make a higher octane fuel, it's more efficient. So you can burn it in an internal combustion engine or ice engine, and you get more efficiency. Um, so maybe you take the efficiency up from 65 to 70 or 75. And if you made a fuel that was a, a higher performance fuel like that, and there was some industry standardization around that, it would drive the auto manufacturers to design engines around that fuel that could, you know, could have better gas mileage, lower emissions, and those would compete with electric vehicles and you know, see you know, whose technology is better and you know, people can make the consumer-driven choice to choose which one they want to do. So that's the solution. And, and to me, uh, and, and to Countrymark, I think that solution is uh, benefits everyone. It gives the auto manufacturers kind of clear direction on, you know, it takes a long time to design an engine. You want to have this engine have a life cycle of a, you know, many years. Um, you know, ethanol is a high octane product. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's really the best cheapest solution for someone to, to get octane high. And so if, if we're in a 95 Ron world, we would blend a lot of ethanol, hmm. um, potentially, you know, significantly more than what we do today. And, you know, obviously it would, it would change the structure of the RFS. It would, you know, potentially go away or, or, or evolve into the, Hey, this is the new specification that we have to do. So it kind of helps everybody. It helps liquid fuels, helps ethanol, helps farms in Indiana, and, and helps Countrymark and, and other refineries have clarity. Part of the reason why the RIN prices have been high and volatile is because there hasn't been clarity. If you look at the volume mandates, the volume mandates are not in line with reality. And when there's uncertainty, you know, obviously you have a lot of people, um, you know, um, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen. And a lot of it when it's, especially when it's EPA policy driven or, um, you know, tweet, you know, tweets, you know, that drive things. Um, it's not the fundamentals of the market. Um, you know, there's a lot of volatility there. I got, I got three here. If we could change it tomorrow, we could just acknowledge that hydrocarbons are over 80% of the uh, global energy and, and uh, just encourage investment and uh, production. Uh, number two was a, uh, Reveal uh, the re RFS, the mandates um, aren't feasible that we have today. Separate gas and diesel, diesel and have two different markets. And the uh, this is the first I've heard of the uh, high octane 95 RON, the, the research octane number. Is mm -hmm. that right? That's right. That's really interesting because that seems like that would fix a lot of a lot of issues. And you would have uh, electric versus combustion competing on their own merit. And from what you've told me, or when I've learned before, is that the... Uh, the renewables are, are cleaner. I think we had uh, one guest, I think it was Ben, was in here, said they were cleaner coming out of the pipe than it was going in the air. So uh, that would be, seems like that would give us a lot more flexibility to have that type of combustion engine uh, that could run on a 95 octane. Would 95 octane run in all motors? No, I mean, I think it would, it would need to be different engines. Um, okay, that's a start. That's a start. That's you right. strike a line and start from there. That's right. Okay. So, you know, similar to how we had kind of this this transition to an 87E10 fuel that's now kind of standard. Um, you know, obviously we went from a leaded fuel to unleaded fuel. It's yep. The next evolution of that okay. would be this higher octane, and you would get more efficiency and, and less uh, emissions from the engine. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think it's important that, that everybody understand that all of these things that we're driving towards are going to require – 
ground that's not being produced any longer. And whether you mine it or you put a solar panel on it or you put a windmill on it or whatever it is that you do, it somewhat destroys its ability or reduces it substantially. We farmed reclaimed ground for years after coal mines, and it does have a little less production. It can be built back up. But once you build a structure on it, it's pretty hard to get that back. So uh, we, as we enter into food versus fuel and the fact that we've seen a few items that have have gotten short, it's, it's not necessarily uncommon to go into a grocery store and see bare shelves. These become issues. I mean... As 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 a, a refiner of of crude and being someone on the outside when it comes to ESG, it's nice that you can come in here and offer feasible items that we can do today and say this makes this better. We are doing what we can, mm-hmm. um, especially as as country mark and being owned by farmers and having uh, our farmers providing our farmers with an opportunity to sell more of their grain and having that opportunity is, is always always good for us. I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to have had this conversation. This is something that we could talk about for several hours. Do you have other other things for him at this point? I just is there anything else, Matt, that you can think of? No, I mean I think that um, you know the overall the overall theme of what we've been talking about is there's lots of challenges. The world is trying to move towards a lower emission world, and we see challenges in how we're going to accomplish that. But what we do know is that this link between energy and agricultural it's you know, it's 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 always been there, obviously, um, with the RFS program and all you know over time. But as more emission driven policies. Um, continue whether it's policy from the federal government or state or diff- different things this link is getting tighter and tighter and, and really to understand you know this world you really need to have a good understanding of the energy industry and the ag industry and they're not siloed um, anymore they're they're inextricably linked so people need okay. to pay attention and well appreciate it well, thank uh, you this is a lot of good information and uh, i I feel like that uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and we could probably cover more. We could we could probably break this apart and hit one of the, each one of these a little deeper as we go. So uh, we look forward to having you back if you're interested, sure. and uh, we'll dig a little deeper into these conversations. So that's all I have. Appreciate so, it. Thank uh, you, gentlemen. Another episode of the High Ground Power by Premier Company.